good to see you all back, smiling and safe and sound. We thank the Lord for preserving Allison and Maria both through their trials. Uh, today we're going to look at Genesis chapter 20, 41. Uh, and this is the big deal about dreams and Joseph. Uh, it gets him out of prison even. So I love that picture, so I just snuck it in. Um, so, and I'm Pastor Dave Couyers of Country Bible Church in Boonville, California, and we are going to look at Genesis 41 today. Uh, I was supposed to do three chapters, and we only got one, so I've been a busy boy. Uh, last time was chapter 39 and 40, and our two-part per, uh, divine outline of the book of Genesis is the first 11 chapters, cover about 2,000 years, and they cover four events, the creation, the fall, the flood, and the scattering of the nations. And that covers about one-third of human history. And then the last 39 chapters only cover about 350 years, and they cover four men, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We're going to still see a little bit more of him now. But the big player from chapter 37 on is Joseph. Remember, we skipped 38 because it's about Judah. And we've made it all the way now to 41. As far as I know, there's probably more chapters about Joseph than almost any other person in the Bible, uh, short of Jesus Christ, who got four books. But And Daniel's a close contender. But So if you would, open your Bibles to chapter 41, and I'll read it for us. I'm going to only read the first 15 verses now. Uh, and then we'll pick up the others later. Genesis 41, verse 1. Now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he was standing by the Nile. And lo, from the Nile there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt, and they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. Then Pharaoh awoke. He fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain came up on a single stalk, plump and good. Verse 6. Then behold, seven ears thin and scorched by the east wind sprouted up after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. Then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Now in the morning his spirit was troubled. So he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men, and Pharaoh told them his dreams. But there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I would make mention today of my own offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants and put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief baker. Verse 11, we had a dream in the same night. He and I, each of us, dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now, a Hebrew youth was there, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, and we related to him, to him, them to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one he interpreted according to his own dream. Verse 13, and just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me in my office, but he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurried and brought him up out of the dungeon. When they shaved himself, uh, when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, "I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And you have, and I have heard said about you that you can hear a dream and you can interpret it." Thank you, folks. So I was really impressed as I went through this and considered this chapter, and I have never done so before on this. I'm calling this one the dream chapter, and I'm going to show you why. Um, I say Joseph was a dreamer. Look at how many references there are here from chapter 40, 41, 41 all the way down to there, and, and one more in 42. That's a lot of dreams in those Joseph chapters, 37 through 42. Uh, there is 38 mentions of dreams in all of Genesis. Dan 
Remember, Dan had all those prophetic dreams. He had uh, two of his own, <coughs> one of King Neb's, and, and a lot of others, and a lot of visitations. But So there's 16 uses of the dream, dreams with the wild card on the end in the NAU Bible in Genesis chapter 41 alone. I count 32 NA uses in the Genesis chapter 37 to 42, the Joseph chapters. The entire book of Daniel has only 27, and that's 12 chapters. So it's a big deal. In the New Testament, Matthew 1 and 2 have six. That's all about the visions and dreams of the Lord Jesus Christ's birth. And four of those were to a guy named, guess what? <laughs> Joseph. Hmm, I said, <laughs> remember, Matthew is mostly written to the Jews. Matthew is the gospel to show that Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews. It's the one that quotes so much from the 200 references of, of the Old Testament of who, who Messiah would be, who the king of the Jews would be. But Joseph was a dreamer. Uh, and I just showed you that one. That may be a duplication, Ellen. Um, so I wanted to take a few minutes and look at dreams just a little bit because there is so much confusion about dreams. Not all dreams are from God. I should have put an exclamation mark. Not all dreams are from God or true or good. Zechariah 10 verse 2. For the teraphims, that's idols, remember? Teraphim speak iniquity, and the diviners see lying visions, and they tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted because there is no shepherd. And I say some things never change. It's still the case. Jeremiah 23, 25 speaks of it. Jeremiah says, I have heard that the prophets have said, uh, who prophesy falsely in uh, God saying, my name, saying, I had a dream, I had a dream. Verse 26, how long is there anything in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy fal falsehood, excuse me, even these prophets of the deception of their own heart, who intend to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which they relate to one another just as their fathers forgot my name because of Baal. The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. Can you? Let me interrupt God's holy word here on verse 28. Can you see the division that God's saying here? They're saying false things with dreams. What are we supposed to do? My word is truth. Let him who has my word Speak my word in truth. Do you have God's word? Yes. Yeah. So we're not to be speaking dreams. We're to be speaking the word of God. What does straw have in common with grain, declares Yahweh? It is not my word, is not my word like fire, declares Yahweh, and like a hammer which shatters the rock? Verse 30. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares Yahweh, who steal my words from each other. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who uses who use their tongues and declare, the Lord declares. Behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord, and related them and led my people astray by their falsehoods and reckless boasting. Yet I did not send them or command them, nor do they furnish this people the slightest benefit, declares Yahweh. Verse 33, now then, now when this people or the prophet of a priest asks you, saying, what is the oracle of the Lord? When you shall say to them, what oracle? What oracle? The Lord declares, I will abandon you. <coughs> That's a false prophet's worst night, nightmare, is to have the Lord abandon them. I haven't heard so much of it lately, but 15 or 20 years ago, uh, it was very much more common. Uh, two of my co-pastors went to uh, Texas for a seminar, and they had some lady come up in the, in the airport and prophesy over them. Turned out to be a complete false prophecy. Uh, a number of other big-name Christian speakers and teachers 
that I've listened to have had the same thing. Somebody comes up and prophesies in the name of God over them, and it's a lie, and it doesn't come true. What did Deuteronomy 18 say to do to prophets that don't prove to be true? Stone them to death. God takes it very, very seriously. So when somebody says, I've had a dream and I'm prophesying over you, or I've got a vision from you or a prophecy for you, guard very carefully against it. Because there are many false prophets out there (coughs) proclaiming Christ's name. So, question is, do we have dreams now that come from God? Now we have Christ and his written word to test everything. You are commanded to test all things by the scriptures. That's why you're here. I'm talking to preaching to the choir now. This is why you're here studying your Bibles. So that you'll know what the Bible says. And you can go and look it up and see if it... What they're saying is true or not. But Hebrews 1.1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways. Let me interrupt. One of those is dreams. Note verse 2. In these last days is spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. So now you have the word, the living word and the written living word. And that's how you're to test these things. So don't be afraid of these dreams. Uh, And my big question is, do do interpretations of dreams add to the word of God? Is the word of God not sufficient, in other words? Revelation 22, 18 says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. That's a very scary verse. You don't want to add to Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Verse 17, So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So if Scripture can equip you for every good work, why would you need to worry about dreams? It's good for training in righteousness, for reproof, for correction, everything. And scripture is profitable. You now have a, a, a book of truth sitting in your lap to test all things. That includes your own dreams or when somebody comes to you with a dream that they've had. Uh, and I was going to add also one here. I'm going to show you that there's three possibilities for dreams. I think it comes up in the next slide. No, I know I did one. I hope I saved it after I may have built it. But I'll give you the short version right now. There's three possibilities for dreams, visions, those kinds of things. It could be of God, could be of the devil, or it could be pizza. And when I say it could be a pizza, I'm talking psychosomatic, where your body, your, your stomach, your troubles can affect your mind, and your mind can affect your body stomach. If I'm worrying about my finances, or the health of my loved one, or the condition of the church, or whatever, if I'm worrying and thinking about that, and I have too much pizza at 11 o'clock at night, I'm going to have dreams and visions, and it'll probably be about whatever I've been thinking about. So you need to sift through that. The only way if you can tell if it's from God or from the devil is whether it lines up with what that book says. We test all things in light of Scripture. Uh, This slide may have got in out of order, but I fear God, he says. 42 verse 18, Now Joseph said to them, On the third day... Do this and give life, for I fear God. And this is that Hebrew word Elohim that we talked about earlier. It has a plural ending. It's capitalized here in the English translations, which tells you it's speaking of the one true living God. If it was lowercase, it would be the same word here, and it might be translated false God, or it may be translated God's plural. 
but a lowercase when the context demands that it's not. But it's the same Hebrew word. Um, and I say this is the first hint that Joseph gives his brother. Their ears, ears should have picked up and go, you fear the living God? You know, when, when they speak like that, not some false Egyptian God by name, but the one true God is who they're referring to, that should have been a big hint to them. Uh, I think it went right over the top of their heads, just like they would have over my brothers. Uh -huh. um, but it's a key point. I fear God. Um, so it looks like I did leave out the pizza slide. I hope it shows up later, but anyway, because I know I didn't convey it in Espanol. But many artifacts have been found in Egypt from the time of chapter 41. A lot of them. A lot of Egyptian uh, uh, artifacts that have been found by archaeologists. One of them would be El Afram newspaper in Cairo wrote, Coins found bearing the name of Joseph. Depiction of a cow linked to Joseph's Pharaoh's dreams. Comes from, the, comes from the world at Nele. Uh, and we're not going to read it. I'm leaving it up there a little bit. In case you want to read it, you can uh, click on it and hope, pause the video. But uh, or maybe I am supposed to read that one. Let me read it. Egyptian coins carrying the name of Joseph, the biblical patriarch, whose arrival in Egypt as a slave eventually provided salvation for his family. During decades of drought across the Middle East, have been discovered as in a cache of antique items shelved in boxes in a museum. According to a new report, the report of the Middle East Media Research Institute said the coins with Joseph's name and image were found in a pile of unsorted artifacts that had been stored at the Museum of Egypt. Ellipsis. Researchers told the newspaper that the minting dates of the coins in the cache have been a match to the period in which Joseph was recorded to be in Egypt. A thorough examination revealed that the coins bore the year in which they were minted and their value or effigies of pharaohs who ruled at the time of their minting. Some of these coins are from the time when Joseph lived in Egypt, bearing his name and portrait, said the newspaper report, Ellipsis. The newspaper called the find unprecedented and said the researchers discovered the coins when they sifted through the thousands of small archaeological artifacts stored in the vaults in the Museum of Egypt. The Egyptian newspaper noted that the Quran indicates clearly that coins were used in Egypt in the time of Joseph. They added that because they tried to say, oh, they didn't even write back in those days, or they didn't know how to mint coins, or they didn't, uh, uh, they didn't count money, uh, on and on, it's stupid. But anyway, ellipsis, the museum research uncovered 500 of the coins carelessly stored in boxes. One even had the image of a cow symbolizing Pharaoh's dream about the seven fat cows and seven lean cows, and the seven green stalks of grain and the seven dry stalks of grain, the report said. Joseph names appears twice on this coin, written in hieroglyphics, once the original name Joseph, and once his Egyptian name, Sabasanani, which was given to him by Pharaoh when he, named, when he became treasure. There is also an image of Joseph, which was part of the Egyptian administration at that time, the report said. Huge thing. Let me say, this is not unusual. A big portion of the New Testament manuscripts that we found and a lot of the archaeological finds that we find don't come from digging in the ground or in old homes or something. They come from digging through old museums. When they would go through and find an archaeological site, they just vacuum it all up like a vacuum cleaner. They catalog it, write down what they found, and stuff it away in some... You remember Raiders of the Lost Ark? When they finally find the ark, what they do? They put it in government storage. Yes. And that's what this is. And, and it's, it's not just occasional. It's hundreds of times they find precious artifacts buried away in some musty museum. Huh. Another uh, one would be the ostracon from the chief baker. And either Eric or Vern, I robbed this from their PowerPoint. But it says an ostracon is a pottery shard with writing 
and it's from the chief baker of the temple of Amun at Thebes acknowledging the receipt of wheat. I didn't see the article on this, so I can't tell you if the scholars believe this was the chief baker that we've been reading about. But it, to me, it's interesting enough that they just title it as the chief baker. Uh -huh. The fact that they had chief bakers and chief cupbearers is pretty obvious from history. But he says, I am reminded, I was intrigued by that. Today I am reminded of my shortcomings, verse 9. And I say, did God remind him of his shortcomings? That's the Holy Spirit's job. Jesus said of the Holy Spirit in John 16, 8, And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. That's the, one of the primary purposes of the Holy Spirit now, is to convict of sin. That he draws you to a point where you fall on your knees and cry out in prayer. Then I was intrigued by the fact that they didn't recognize him. This is their own brother. I mean, their very own brother. Younger brother, so they knew him when he was little and they watched him grow up. He was the youngest of them up until he got Benjamin. Verse 14, when he had shaved and changed his clothes. I say it's been over 20 years since they've seen him, and now he's shaved and wearing Egyptian royalty clothes. He's speaking Egyptian through an interpreter. No wonder his brothers didn't recognize him. I mean, I've had guys that I've worked with and knew very well, and they shave off their beard and they come to work, and I think it's a new employee. Yeah, have you ever done something like that? I mean, the beard's gone or the mustache is gone. I'm so easily deceived. I go, who's that? <laughs> My oldest daughter's father-in-law was a prominent figure in the valley as a major logger here in Anderson Valley. And, uh, and he used to hang out at the drive-in. But he had three names. He'd go by Robert, he'd go by Bob, and he'd go by Mancher. And, and the lady at the drive-in, after knowing him for many years, finally figured out that those three names were one person. <laughs> the guy who'd been coming in and opening up her coffee shop at four in the morning every morning. You know, and she finally figured out who he was, that it was one, only one person. And that's because he would shave his beard, he'd change his clothes, change his hat, whatever, and enough to trick you up. Uh, let me read the next few verses here. Verse 16. Joseph then answered Pharaoh, saying, Is it not in me? It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Verse 17. So Pharaoh spoke to Joseph in my dream, behold, I was standing on the bank of the Nile, and behold, seven cows, fat and sleek, came up out of the Nile, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Lo, seven other cows came up <coughs> after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such as I have never seen for ugliness in all the land of Egypt. And the lean and the ugly cows ate up the first fat cow, seven fat cows. <coughs> Yet when they had devoured them, it could not be detected that they had devoured them, for they were just as ugly as before. Then I awoke. Uh, verse 22. I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears, full and good, came up in a single stalk. And lo, seven ears withered, thin, and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears, then I was told to them, then I told it to the magicians, and there was no one who could explain it to me. Verse 25. Now Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. And the dreams are one and the same. Let me read that again. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one and the same. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven thin ears scorched by the east wind will be seven years of famine. It is as I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt, and after them seven years of famine will come and all the abundance will be forgotten in the land, uh, and the famine will ravage the land. Verse 31, 
So the abundance will be unknown in the land because of that subsequent famine, for it will be very severe. Now as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God and God will quickly bring it about. Now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him extract a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Then let them gather all the food uh, of these good years that are coming and store up the grain of food for the cities under Pharaoh's authority. Let them guard it. Let the food become as a reserve for the land of the seven years of famine which occur in the land so that the land will not perish during, during the famine. Is that the end of it? Yes. I wanted to go back to this because I didn't do a slide in it. Um, Let him extract a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Many, our tax system was, and our interest system was biblically based. We used to have a 10% usury law that nobody in America could charge more than 10% interest on any debt. No bank, no nobody could charge more than 10%. That's now been violated big time in the 60s when the banks took over the country. Um, there's also many who believe that 20% tax should never be exceeded. Oh, I, I know what I paused for. I started to say, we just got notice on one of our credit cards that they're now going to start charging 33% interest. 33% interest on a credit card debt. Needless to say, it's getting paid off and retired, but anyway. But the other one was this uh, one-fifth of the produce of the land. Many hold that the government should never charge more than 20% taxes total. It's un-American to tax more than 20% total. It's un-American to charge more than 10% interest. We have become corrupted in the last 30 or 40 years to an extreme degree. But once the government has taken more than 20%, and I didn't do a slide for it either, but at the same time, I see a lot of criticism of why churches are not taxed. Facebook is getting to be more and more hostile to taxing churches, nonprofits. What we find here was the only lands that were exempt from these taxes were the churches and the priests. In the, in the Hebrew culture and the Egyptian one. Okay, I'm really on a rabbit trail now. <laughs> so, uh, I'm curious about this. Did any of you also get to see the King Tut display when it traveled the country? How, how impressed were you? It was amazing. It was amazing. It blew my mind, the gold. And the, what I've read is that was like a single digit percentage of the gold. Uh, that, you know, it's like less than 10% of the gold of, that Egypt has found in the tombs and stuff that was on display. And it was mind-boggling. I mean, it was huge displays of gold, uh, massive money. And that's crucial because there's a lot of Bible references to the gold in Egypt. But in verse 16, he says, I cannot do it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God. That's a key phrase right there, but God. Daniel does this all the time also, but God. A great response, uh, this should be on the tip of our tongues, always thinking, I can't, but God. Uh -huh. He is capable, he is able, he loves us so much, he sent his son to die on the cross for us, but God can pull me through this. 40 verse 8, we read, Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpret belongs, interpretations belong to God. And then he said, we looked at this last time, Tell me your dreams. Well, which is it, Joseph? Does God interpret dreams or do you interpret dreams? Interpretations belong to God, period, but tell me your dreams. How does that relate to us? 
You are an ambassador for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through you. When people come with these dreams and visions and everything else, you're standing there as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You say, I don't have any wisdom that would do this. But God, or but God says, okay? But God, you want to think of but God. I should have highlighted and bolded that one, but I didn't. Uh, and I say, consider quoting Joseph when someone starts to tell you about a dream. Oh, I did get the slide in. Now, there are three possible sources for dreams. God, could be of God, could be of Satan, could be a pizza. If we eat too much pizza when we have dreams, it's called a psycho psychosomatic reaction or response. And they are natural. Our body relates to our mind and our mind relates to our body. Uh, there's so much. The Bible in the Old Testament, they don't use heart like we do about the source of our soul and being the intellect. They use bowels. And we're now finding that your bowels, your guts, your lower tract especially, has a huge amount to do with your health. Only 10% of the cells in your body are human. Let me repeat that. Only 10% of the cells in your body are human. That's how much is going on in your digestive tract and stomach. Bacterium, enzymes, viruses, beneficial stuff, all kinds of things are going on. And when your stomach and your mind work together, we call that a psychosomatic reaction. This word psycho, you, know, you see that, right? Having to do with the mind. And soma is the Greek word for body. So it's a mind-body reaction. Makes you bad when you're, <laughs> when you're, when you're in fermo, huh? Yeah. And it affects your mind. It's hard to think clear when you're sick. And so on. Another rabbit trip. Uh, I'm going to read the next uh, 20 verses here. Verse 47. During the seven years of plenty, the land brought forth abundantly... So he gathered all the food of those seven years which occurred in the land of Egypt and placed the food in the cities. He placed in every city the food from its own surrounding fields. Thus Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure. Now before the year of the famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, for, he said, God has made me forget all my trouble in all my father's household. Verse 52, he named the second Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. When the seven years of plenty from which it had been in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph had said. Then there was famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread, and Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, and whatever he says to you, you shall do. Verse 56, When the famine was spread over all the face of the earth, when Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold, the, sold to the Egyptians, and the famine was severe in the land of Egypt, all the people of the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in the earth. This is a free enterprise economy. This is not communistic. This is not socialistic. What did they do when the people are starving to death? Their flocks and herds are starving to death. And what's the example that they sold them? He sold to the Egyptians. They came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph. There's no welfare state here. Can you see that? This is free enterprise. This is not Marxism. This is capitalism. And that's one of the reasons why they were one of the most powerful planets, places on earth for a long time. You know, in a, now what our culture is doing is they just dump stuff on them. Have you ever gone to Yellowstone or Yosemite or one of them where there's bears 
And they'll post big signs all over, do not feed the bears. Why? Because they get lazy and they don't go out and forage for food. And the forage food is better for them than the handout that they get. And we have reversed that process with our welfare system. And it's communism, it's socialism, whatever you want to call it. It's Marxism. Joseph gets raised up again. This is, I've lost count. It must be his second or third time already. Uh, Verse 40. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you, says Pharaoh. Psalm 110, verse 1, thinking of our Lord Jesus Christ, the most quoted verse in the New Testament of the Old Testament, says, Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord says to my Lord, I apologize for that. That one there, the first Lord is Yahweh. It should have been all caps. But my Bible program in the past used to erase the all caps. And this is one of them. I need to fix that, Ellen. Um, But Yahweh says to my Adonai, is what he says in the Greek. The Lord says to my Lord, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So this is one of the verses I like to take to uh, the JWs especially, who say that Jesus is not infinite God. I say, who was the king who is the Lord God of King David? And what will the Jehovah Witness say? Jehovah, right? And I say, well, take a look at Psalm 110, verse 1. There it says, uppercase L, uppercase O, uppercase R, uppercase D. Even in their Bible, Yahweh, it says, Yahweh says to King David's Adonai. Did King David worship Yahweh? Jehovah? You betcha. Who was was the one that he worshipped? Psalm 23, verse 1. Yahweh says to my Lord. No. uh, Yahweh is my shepherd. And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Whole separate study. Good apologetics for reaching people that are convinced that Jesus Christ is not Almighty God. Uh, Daniel 2, 48. Then the king, and it's King Neb, Nebuchadnezzar, placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. Same thing again. The Son of God, infinite deity, took on humanity, and the Father raised him up to sit at the right hand of his throne. All the kingdoms of the universe belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you as a follower of Christ, when you are in Christ, it is your inheritance also. Daniel 5.29, then Daniel was raised up three times. Uh, 5.29, then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. This is actually what he was, was in an executive position, the second, because the father king was out of the land fighting wars. So he was the second, just like uh, Joseph. 6, 1, and 2, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrations over them, one of whom was Daniel. Daniel was raised up to the second position again. And only the father is greater in verse 40. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. And I say not greater as in more human, but a greater role. That's where Christ is now. Jesus says, I am the Father's, he says in 1428, you heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. The people that hate the Bible come back and say Jesus couldn't be the Father because um, couldn't be infinite God because the Father is greater than him. Nobody's greater than God. They fail to understand that Jesus is 100% deity and 100% humanity. And you have to determine which nature he's speaking of. In his role on planet Earth as a hungry, beaten human, the Father is greater. Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father, he says in John 14, 9. Anyone who's seen me has seen Pharaoh. You think Joseph would have said that? 
No, he wouldn't, but he is in that position. He's got the signet ring, he's riding the horse, he's got the gold chain, he's got the robes, so he's acting in the Pharaoh's position. I thought it was interesting that Joseph is 30 years of age in verse 46. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Uh, in 1 Samuel 13, 1, Saul was 30 years old when he became king. Uh, 2 Samuel 5, 4, David was 30 years old when he became. And then, lo and behold, now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. And Hebrew culture in the, that first century, in the Bible times, was that you couldn't be a rabbi until you were at least 30 years of age. They even wouldn't let young men read the Song of Solomon until they were 30 years of age. If my granddaughter asked me about the Song of Solomon. They wanted me to do a study with them, and I, and I dropped the ball. But I said, whatever you read in there, if you're thinking, wow, that sounds like it's describing something very intimate. Yeah, <laughs> The Hebrew is very graphic, and that's exactly what's going on in the Song of Solomon. It's a married couple's <laughs> book. It's not, uh, not for young single men. Uh, verse 51, the NIV notes say, Manasseh sounds like and may be derived from the Hebrew to forget. And Ephraim sounds like the Hebrew for twice uh, fruitful or double fruitfulness. And I love what J. Vernon McGee says. He calls them, Ephraim and Manasseh, he calls them amnesia and ambrosia, <laughs> fruitful and forgetful. Um, and it's also of interest, we'll do it later when they come up again, but uh, it's always Ephraim and Manasseh on the order of it in the Bible. Uh, more artifacts from Egypt at the time of chapter 41. And I say, Egypt was faithful and dependable in every relationship. God is Father Potiphar, the jailer, and Pharaoh. He never stumbles that way. With his brothers, I'm not so comfortable. It seems he's a little bit deceptive to his brothers. We're going to look at that. But uh, anyway. Understandably so. Did I just show you this one on the Egyptian coins? This is a different source, I think. Uh, the biblical patriarch ID'd in Hylergoth's depiction of a code linked to Pharaoh's dream from world. I think it's a different article. This one, I picked it up from David Hawking at uh, his website, his email. But anyway, so I say don't, don't squint. I tarry down there long enough for if you're wanting to read the article, you can download it, or even better yet, go to the website or find it on your own. <coughs> I thought it's interesting that verse 9 brings up the idea of a vine. Vine, when I say vine, what do you think of? Grapes. <laughs> well, that's because you live in vineyard country. But. <laughs> Biblically speaking, when I say vine, what do you think of? I'm going to show you. 40 verse 9, so the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me. Interesting. You got a dream and all of a sudden a vine is in your dream right in front of you. Verse 11 uh, of Genesis 49, we're going to get to that in a few weeks hopefully. He ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. Uh, if you've read the last uh, few chapters of Isaiah, you'll recognize this, washes his robes in the blood of grapes. Nobody does that. But there it says that I, the Messiah is going to come, and they're going to say, why are your robes stained with blood? Uh, and that. Uh, but this prophecy also is of Judah where we get the lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, and he ties his foal to a vine and his donkey's coat. As soon as I say donkey's coat, don't you think Zechariah 9.9? 9? You should. Psalm 80, verse 14. O God of hosts, ellipsis, look down from heaven and see and take care of this vine. Speaking of Israel, national Israel. 2 Kings 13, 18, 31. Each at 
uh, this is a judgment also. It's a little out of place here, but uh, eat each of his own vine and each of his fig tree. Uh, Jeremiah 6, 9, thus says Yahweh of hosts, they will thoroughly glean as the vine, the remnant of Israel, pass your hand over like a gather, gathered over the branches. Uh, so uh, lots of references to vines and branches and fig trees that relate to Israel and Messiah both. Zechariah 3.10, in that day, and there's that eschatological phrase again, it means we're talking end times. In that day, declares Yahweh of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and under his fig tree. Yet future millennial kingdom stuff, uh, Zechariah 8.12, for there will be peace for the seed. The vine will yield its fruit. The land will yield its produce and the heavens will declare their due. And I will cause the remnant of Israel, I would add, of this people to gather all these things. Or Isaiah 5.7 is a good worthwhile reference for you to remember. It speaks of the vineyard here. You could say, translate that orchard just as easily. And it's referring to the fig tree. You remember how Jesus cursed a fig tree because it didn't have fruit when it was not the season? And, it's, and says you'll never bear fruit again? The fig tree is a picture of Israel. That's where he's declaring the unpardonable sin to national Israel. And from that point on, he turns his back on national Israel and goes to the Gentiles with his Jewish disciples. Verse Isaiah 5, 7. For the vineyard of, or the orchard of the Lord Yahweh of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. So disappointing thing. Jesus wept over Jerusalem and Luke John 15, 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Why did I drag you through all these vine verses? I don't want you to miss the significance of this. You need to be thinking Christ in all these things. 101 ways that Joseph should remind you of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. So let me go back and accent that a little bit because the next verse ties it up. This is written to his disciples, his followers. And it's a warning that you need to be pruned. The pruning increases fruiting, right, with the vineyards. We prune them so they bear more fruit. And he's saying that's what happens if you're already bearing fruit. And if you're not bearing fruit, you know, he, he's gonna, uh, he takes away and disposes of it. It doesn't mean you lose your salvation, but you're like the guy in 1 Corinthians 3 who's standing there naked. All of his life effort has been burned up, and he smells like smoke. At the Bema seat. But I am the true vine. You are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Uh, John 15, 5. Johanan in the Greek. So why do I take you through this deal on the vine? Because you are identified with it here. You need to, your existence is about and for to the vine. So my question to you is, is Joseph's deception of his father and brothers uh, lying? I wonder about it. Verse 9 of chapter 42, this is out of place. I shouldn't have done this one now. Uh, but we'll pick it up again next time. This will be a reminder. Lord bless you in your work, young man. Uh, Joseph remembered the dreams which he had about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come here to look at undefended parts of our land. <laughs> and you remember back in 27, verse 19, when Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Get up, 
Please sit and eat of my great game that you may bless me. Huge lie. Big time lie. And this is from his father. They say, father like son, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. Well, you know, a lot of people hold Joseph up as the, the best example of Christian behavior after Jesus Christ. And I don't agree with that. I think Daniel is a far better example. They're both Jews, and Hebrews, so, I mean, it's limited, and they're in the Old Testament. But nonetheless, Joseph, for his rejection of sin, is to be commended above almost everybody else. Another one of more artifacts from Egypt. Nine rings were found in Egypt. This is a ring that they would seal, you know. They would put wax on a document and seal it. Or if, if the holder of the ring was out in the marketplace and he wanted to buy 20 cores of wheat, they'd get a piece of wet clay and he would press the, the signet ring into it. And that was like the governor signed it. And that's what they looked like. You can see it was a ring to go around somebody's finger. Uh, they were found in Avarice, where the ring was found, in an archaeological dig. What a neat way they've excavated that, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, this is another one. This is the royal ring of Ramses II. This one's probably bronze. Uh, the temporary lesser ones would probably be baked ceramic. but. Uh, and it says, biblical creation... One of nine rings found in Egypt that belonged to Joseph and his servants, dated to 3,700 years. The ring is translated as Jacob, or Jacob, Bahar, which means he chose. And they say Egyptians wore the, their rings declaring them the son of their many gods. Joseph, not being keen on this, more than likely had this ring made up to honor Jacob, his father, and the one true God, the second word in there. Bahar, okay? So that's their speculation. I would think it's probably true, knowing Joseph. I can't imagine him putting on a, a ring of one of the Egyptian deities. Uh, there's a good article here. I'm tearing over it so that if somebody wants to pause the video, they can try to read it there. But way better than that is to go to the web signs or look it up on your own. Uh, and... Um, Egyptian chronology is dating is confusing. And I see scholars debating it all the time, but which pharaoh we're talking about, at which point in time, at which uh, pyramid and so on. Uh, but possession of the Amu tomb of Kanumhatap the uh, second, and that's a composite, shows Semitites wearing coats of many colors entering Egypt and that's from the comments from, Egypt, from Wikipedia by Riddle. So you see these various long-sleeved, long, they don't have long sleeves on them, but interesting. They have various multicolored robes. And you see they have beards on. I'm sure that's why they feel that it's Semitic. I'm sure there's other things that identify the Egyptians. But anyway, you've got this strange thing of this wall painting, a mural there of the goats and lambs and the famine and whatever else is all tied up in it. Uh, many Egyptian scholars debate the chronology of the Egyptian pharaohs and the dates that they, they ruled. CMI has an article on their website, as do many others. So that's their web address again. You can look it up. Uh, and that's about a response they got to one of their mentions of a so anyway, then this is a big one. Uh, the Famine Stella, it's called, is an inscription written in Egyptian hieroglyphics located in the Sahel Island in the Nile, in the Nile, near Aswan in Egypt, which tells of a seven-year period of drought and famine during the reign of Pharaoh. This one doesn't say that Joseph is mentioned in it. And this is a strange thing here that's this crack. I'm assuming it's a crack that the rocks split and they're saying that they missed some pieces of the story. Do you see it? So maybe Joseph was mentioned there or whatever. But uh, the Famine Stella, the History of 3,000 3, is the website. 
It's an inscription written in Egyptian hieroglyphics on a 2.5 millimeter high and 3 millimeter wide block of granite located on Sahel Island near Aswan. The stela tells the story of seven years of drought and famine during the reign of Pharaoh, a dossier of the third dynasty, uh, that'd be 2686 BC uh, to about 2613. It is thought that the stele was inscribed during the Ptolemaic kingdom, that's Greek, by the king of Ptolemy, by King Ptolemy. Uh, so there, so that's called the famine wall, and there's the website address for it. So you can look at that up if you want to. And I grabbed these pictures also because of this interesting thing of the Egyptians up there, and I wonder if there's shepherds in there as well, but more than anything to show you what three millimeters, what three meters looks like and two and a half meters. It's a big block of granite. Um, and it has some carved sections that are missing. We looked at those. So, And this is a lousy map, but I threw it in because it was there also. It's way down here is where we're talking about. Uh, and this would be the, what we call the Aswar Dam. The Russians built in Egypt. It was one of the biggest mistakes ever made to the environment was drying up the Nile by putting a dam in it. And uh, I believe it's all dry now. I think they've tr taken it out. There was a lot of controversy about if they could take it out, if it would still restore it. And I haven't stayed abreast of it. But anyway, that's where the Ansoir Dam would be. Oh, I wanted to go back to that one also. This region down here, I had another picture. I don't know if I included it. But do you see this flat plain down here? Fertile flat plain? That's where the Hebrews went, Gothen. And Pharaoh says it's the best in the land, and it was. And, the, and he directs that all their cattle should go down there and graze down there. And it's, the fertility is dependent upon this flooding that would happen every year and irrigate the whole land. Sub, subsurface irrigation would water all the plants that they had. They didn't have to pump water. They do now. Uh, even in modern times, I see foot treadmills and things that they dig water out of the river for their plants. But So we're at the end of it. Remember 101 ways that Joseph speaks of Christ should at least remind you of the Lord Jesus Christ. We looked at the last 11 last time, but 12, Joseph was sent forth by his father. 13, Joseph seeks the welfare of his brothers. 14, Joseph was sent forth from the vale of Hebron. 15, Joseph came to Shechem. 16, Joseph now became a wanderer in the field. Clearly a reference to Jesus. 17, Joseph seeks until he finds his brethren. He doesn't give up. He went the next 50 miles to go find them. Joseph was conspired against by his brothers. Joseph's words were disbelieved. They wouldn't listen to him. Joseph was insulted. Joseph was cast into a pit. Joseph was taken out of the pit alive in his body. And I'm in the camp that thinks, I'll bet you when we ask Joseph about it, he'll say, yeah, they left me down there three days before I was lifted up out of the pit. And it was a pit without water. Joseph, brethren, mingled hypocrisy with their hatred. Uh, verse 24, Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver because he's not as crucial as Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Verse 25, Joseph's blood-sprinkled coat was presented to his father. I would bet you anything it was a seamless one-piece robe, Psalm 22. And uh, the Gospels tell that the, the dogs didn't cut Jesus' garment. They raffled it off or gambled it off. So, in closing, I found this about seven I just realized that the word seven has even in it. That's odd. <laughs> I tried to put it up here in Spanish. I know it doesn't come across, but can you see this word and this word are so close? <laughs> and this one is even, not odd. <laughs> and then this one, we're almost to election time. And my hope is in not in the donkey or the elephant. My hope is in the lamb. Amen? Amen. I like that one. And then I know we're way past the flood thing, but <laughs> let's see that. 
<laughs> sticking his tongue out at all the enemies. And these guys are probably doing the same thing to the Egyptians too. <laughs> uh, and then this. You may be a Solomon in wisdom, or a David in praise, or an Abraham in faith, or a Joshua in war. But if you are not a Joseph in discipline, you will end up like Samson in destruction. Isn't that cool? I like that one. So, and I say, I love this picture too, World War II aircraft, I'm sure. Forgetting the past and looking forward to the future. And then, what a cool picture, huh? Can you imagine that job out on the, in the ocean on top of a uh, submarine. submarine, nuclear submarine, checking the oil or whatever he's doing, you know, <laughs> plugging up a hole or putting the cork back in one of the holes or something, you know. Coming off barnacles. Yeah, probably chipping off barnacles <laughs> at sea, yeah. I say, work safely. May God bless you in his perfect protection. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then the end. And for our, our viewing audience especially, uh, this comes from dividedbytruth.org. Man is sinful. Your good works, your religion, your philosophy, or your morality won't get you across the divide between sinful mankind and an infinitely holy God. Apart from sin, separated from sin. Uh, and 1 Timothy 2.5 says, there, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The Philadelphians in Ukiah emphasize this on their billboard over there. I see it's faded out, and I'm glad of that now. Because they put this in bold and red, the man Christ Jesus. They're ignorant of the fact that, yes, Jesus Christ is the only being who's had two natures, infinitely divine and wholly human, both at the same time. So when you speak of Jesus, the only way to be saved is through the shed blood of a literal human being, someone who is completely human. And it wouldn't be adequate for all creation to be saved if it wasn't also that Christ Jesus is infinite deity. When you put Christ in front of Jesus, this is his office. If I say President Biden, President is not his first name. It's the office that he holds. Christ is the office that Jesus holds. It's the Christos. It's the Mashiach Nagid, the mighty ruling reigning Hebrew of the king of the Jews. That's what's encapsulated in this word. So yes, if you're going to bold and underline the man, you better also separate it and bold and underline Christos also. Because he is God incarnate. He is the one prophesied hundreds of times in the Old Testament that God would come, a man, a baby would be born, a son would be given, a child would be born and a son would be given, Isaiah 9, 6. Infinite deity came, eternal son, mighty God, Isaiah 9, 6 calls him. And that's who we're talking about when we say this. So it's blasphemous for them to underline in bold and red on their billboard the man, when they don't give honor to the position of him as emperor of the world, king of the universe, infinite deity, almighty God. Amen? Amen. That's another rabbit trail. Thank you so much, guys. We appreciate your effort. Uh, and we want to go here and go delete and go here. Did you ever hear about the guy whose mom named him Odd? The guy who? His mother named him Odd. <laughs> That's even. <laughs> and his whole life, he, he hated his name because people would always make fun of him. So when he died, he decided to leave his tombstone blank. Well, people would come by and they'd see it and they'd say, well, isn't that odd? <laughs> isn't that odd? That is odd, yeah. <laughs> That's really odd. <laughs> Poor guy.